who is a God like our God. I love that line. Open your Bibles this morning, if you would, to Psalm 11. Psalm 11, and then we will also look at uh, 2 Samuel 15, if you want to put a marker there. Psalm 11 and 2 Samuel 15. We uh, had a little internet blip earlier, and uh, I, I mentioned, if you missed it, that even though this building uh, feels somewhat dead, uh, we know that this building is not the church. The church is not dead. The church is very much alive. And evidence of that would be the fact that Cornerstone Community Church gave over $7,000 to our general fund last week without having a church service on site. And I just want to praise God for your faithfulness. And I know that, of course, our our budget, you know, our um, spending plan calls for 10300 a week. But for the first week where we're learning to give online and we're getting into a kind of a new routine, praise God for that over $7,000. Um, now, I typically do not um, vi- venture away from a sermon series. Our series has been uh, Welcome to Church. And uh, usually I will just drive right on through a series, even though it's Independence Day or President's Day or Valentine's Day. I like to stay on my sermon map. And, uh, but there is one circumstance in which I will venture off of the sermon map, and that would be if God tells me to. And uh, I really felt led of the Lord this week to look at Psalm 11, which was not on the sermon map. Uh, but the truth is we don't follow a holy sermon map, right? We follow the Holy Spirit. And so Psalm 11, uh, I want to just begin by reading the first three verses. Psalm 11, I'm reading from the New American Standard. There is a superscript which would be sort of like verse zero. Uh, It is in the original inspired manuscript of the Hebrew Bible. and, And it says this, for the choir director... A Psalm of David. Verse 1. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. Verse 3. If the foundations are destroyed... What can the righteous do? When I was in the 8th grade, um, we did in middle school something called science fair projects. And I'm not sure if, if that's still done the way it was when I was growing up in the 80s. But we would build these big backboards and, and, and we would put our problem statement. We'd use these stick-on letters and our, our problem statement and our hypotheses and our observations and our conclusions and maybe you did something like that when you were a child maybe maybe some schools are still doing science fair projects but you would all the kids would put their projects in the library and and judges would come by and I remember looking at the projects and this one little boy's project all he had was a problem statement the rest of his backboard was blank and his problem statement was this my problem was I didn't have enough time to do this project. <laughs> and then we'll forget that. And, uh, and so anyway, my mom took me down to Tybee Island off the coast of Savannah, Georgia. And we were going to do uh, a, a study of beach erosion. And so uh, we went out at low tide on the south end of the island. And we staked down, drove rebar down into the sand several feet tied a string across the rebar right at the sand level and we were going to evaluate what the what the beach did through several cycles of the tide and so we we set up at low tide we went to dinner and we had plans to go out about midnight at high tide to take some pictures of the water as it crashed against the seawall so about 11 p.m we're in our hotel room and we begin to kind of stir around and make plans to go down uh, about midnight to, to take these pictures. Well, about that time, I, we began to hear something 
in the room above us. And it was a very ominous, uh, frightful moaning and groaning. It, it sounded like somebody was dying. Oh. Oh. Well, we just knew the zombie ghost of Tidy Island was in that motel. And I'm telling you, we became gripped with fear. And I would say to you that fear began to advise us. And fear said this, if you venture out the doors of this motel room, you will be hacked into many pieces. And so we spent the entire night just uh, really hostages to, to fear in the, in the hotel room. So the next morning, of course, we didn't get our pictures. The next morning, we're at a little uh, restaurant right beside the, the motel that, there on Tybee Island. And I, I'm just sitting there eating breakfast. And if I'm lying, I'm dying. This happened right behind me. I began to hear it. <sighs> my eyes got big. I looked at my mom. I turned around. And there was a severely handicapped boy in a wheelchair sitting at the table behind me. <laughs> and, uh, and so obviously he, he and his family were, were staying in the room right above us. And, and my point in, in saying all of that is this. The answer to faith is the topic today to the advice of fear. The answer of faith to the advice of of fear. Now, Psalm 11, of course, is of David. Somebody in the psalm has begun to give David the advice of fear. As a matter of fact, when it says, <clears throat> um, when David says, How can you say to my soul in verse 1? The you is plural. And I want to say this to you there's going to be times in our lives when the advice of fear is more than one voice, there's going to be times it's coming from all directions. And, and, and the voice of fear says, David, run to your mountain. Flee like a bird. Why? What else can you do, David? The foundations have crumbled. And it gets worse, David. When you flee, chances are you'll never make it out of here alive. Because while you are fleeing, don't forget, David, they're shooting from the dark at you. Now, I don't know... If you've been there personally, but many of us have, some are there now, let's be honest. You look around and it seems as though the very foundation of your life has crumbled. Sometimes this happens in the courthouse. Sometimes this happens in the doctor's office. Sometimes it's in the funeral home or the police station. Sometimes it's in your employer's office or your son's bedroom. Sometimes it just happens sitting in the living room watching the news. A lot of times it's accompanied by a lump in your throat, by a gnawing in your stomach. Sometimes you feel like you're going to pass out. I experienced all three of those as I walked into the impound lot on February the 7th, 2002. I was in Porterdale, Georgia, just outside of Covington. I was going to clean out my dad's pickup truck, the one that he had died in two days earlier. And I can remember as I walked into that impound lot feeling so much despair. Can you write this down if you're taking notes? The advice of fear says focus on your feelings. That's what mom and I did all night on Tybee Island. We focused on our feelings. And that's really what I was uh, uh, doing as I walked into that impound lot uh, to clean out my dad's truck. As I walked in, I, I felt so much despair. So my mom and I, uh, you know, the next morning we heard that groaning behind us at the table and realized it was... Nothing to be afraid of. You know, feelings are a terrible choice 
A terrible option, a terrible thing to base your life choices on. Brandy and I, when, we, uh, when I got out of Georgia Tech, we moved to South Mississippi right away. Uh, she, was, she taught school one year in Georgia while I finished up my engineering degree. And I'm telling you, we was broke. We were so poor. We were so poor, we would go to Kentucky Fried Chicken just to lick other people's fingers. And, uh, but but we, I had a 1984 Mercury Marquis, and she had a 1980 Ford Fairmont. Fairmount, Fairmont, something like that. And it was an old phone company car. And these phone company cars, it was called Bell South, and they had a blue and a yellow stripe all the way from the front to the back. And somebody had taken white spray paint and just painted over the stripes. I mean, this was a grandma car. But this is, what, this is what she drove. And we're driving down I-65, moving from the Atlanta area to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And we get just south of Montgomery. Of course, neither of our cars had air conditioning, or they had it, but it didn't work. And I got my window down, and I'm going down the road and down I-65 and my Ford in my Mercury marquee, and I leaned up to get something off the dashboard, and when I leaned back, a wasp began to sting me right in the middle of my back. And I'm going 70 miles an hour down the highway, and I reach back, and I grab that wasp, and I began to just squeeze him because he's down in my shirt, stinging me in the back. And I'm grabbing him, and I'm squeezing him, and I'm trying to kill him, and I'm all over the road, and finally... He begins to sting me in the palm of the hand. And he's got his stinger in my hand. And I'm off in the median. And I'm swerving. And Brandy's behind me. She thinks I'm having a stroke or a heart attack. I finally get the car stopped. She stops. She comes running up. I jump out of the car. I rip my shirt off. And I'm screaming, It's a wasp! It's a wasp! He's stinging me! He's stinging me! He stung me in the hand! And I showed her I had a little dot on my hand where it was just a little spot of blood. She said, let me see your back. She could see where he'd poke me in the back, but it wasn't swelling at all. And, man, we're looking for the wasp. We can't find the wasp anywhere. And, uh, and about that time, I said, well, I don't know, but I know this. He's stinging me. And I looked down, and right there by the door where I had ripped my shirt off, was one of the thumbtacks that I had pinned in my headliner to the roof. I had leaned forward, and that thumbtack had fallen down my shirt. And when I leaned back to the seat, it was poking me right in the back and then in the hand. And so, you know, the advice of fear (laughs) says focus on your feelings. Write this down. The advice of fear says focus on your circumstances. Focus on your circumstances. Look at CNN. The advice of fear says, look at the Dow. The advice of fear says, look at the S&P. Look at your 401k. Look at the toilet paper aisle. Look at the x-ray. Look at the biopsy. Look at the bank statement. Look at the divorce papers. G. Campbell Morgan was a pastor in the early 20th century. He pastored at the Westminster Chapel in London before Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was a mentor to Martin Lloyd-Jones. G. Campbell Morgan said this, Fear sees only the things that are near. Faith takes in the larger distances. Fear sees only the things that are near. Faith takes in the larger distances. When I read the advice of fear in our text, verses 1b to verse 3, I recognize that the name and the thought of God are absent from the advice of fear. Last Monday was a long day. We, uh, I made a video that morning, and then our elders met for quite a while after lunch. And, and then I was trying to make another video. And, and all day long, I was thinking, man, I've got to get to the grocery store. I've got to get to the grocery store. And, 
Honestly, what I had on my mind was milk. For some reason, I feel like if our family has milk in the refrigerator, all is well. We're going to be okay, you know. And, uh, and milk's important to me. Our family, for probably 15 or 20 years, we drank a gallon a day, no lie. And so um, I, I was thinking, man, we got to have milk. Because I'm one of these people, I can't eat a cookie or a brownie. Or a granola bar, I can't eat it. I'd rather just not eat one if I don't have a glass of milk. And so I'm thinking, all right, I know what I'm going to do. Everybody's going to be going to Hy-Vee or Dollar General to get their milk. And I know they're going to be sold out. So I'm going to go to BP. Because nobody will think to go to BP for milk. So I finally get out of here and I go across the road to the BP. Guess how many gallons of milk they had at the BP? One. Oh, yay! They, there's, at least there's one, right? I can make it another day. Of course, it expired like a week ago, so I didn't even buy that one. So after dinner, Brandy and I, we went to Hy-Vee, and I can remember standing at the end of the toilet paper aisle, just looking up that aisle. It looked like, it looked like the Hy-Vee had gone out of business on that aisle. I mean, there was not a single thing on the shelves. And in that moment, fear began to advise me. You need to panic. You need to worry. And it's kind of funny, the things that sold out. Toilet paper was sold out. Brownie mixes. There was not a brownie box mix in the store, right? I'm just like, what's wrong with Americans? Brownies and toilet paper. But I do want to give a shout out, just for a moment, for all of our high V employees. From our grocery stores, especially think about Miss Rose, Miss Amy and their team, Miss Amy and the pharmacy. I praise God for you guys. I praise God for those in the distribution center, for our truck drivers. I think about David Palmer, Tony Richard, uh, Dan Garrison. I think about Missy Atwell, who was stocking the shelves that night we were in there. And then not only Hy-Vee, but Dollar General and, and all of those who who are distributors of food and life-sustaining things like brownies and toilet paper, right? But let's admit, fear sees only the things that are near or maybe the things that are no longer near, right? Like toilet paper. But faith takes in the larger distances. Now, I cannot be dogmatic about this, but there's some clues in this psalm that... that really give us some ideas about what's going on in David's life. First of all, the advice of fear says run to your mountain, David. Your mountain. Not the mountains, your mountain. What does that mean? Well, that means that David has hidden in these mountains before. If you remember, early in David's life when he was on the run from Saul, he would find refuge in the caves, in the strong, uh, strongholds in the side of the mountains of the hill country. Let me read 1 Samuel 23, 14. And David remained in the strongholds, in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. Now we know from verse number 2 in our text, David's being attacked. You could say, well, this is probably the time when Saul was attacking him. Maybe. But there's another clue in verse number 3 that I think is really important. The advice of fear asks David a question. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now the word foundations in the Hebrew, and I'm not being crude here, I'm I'm trying to give you the, the word. The word foundations comes from the word buttock, okay? It's the word backside, uh, it, it, it's, maybe you've heard of this. Have you heard of the phrase, the county seat? Uh, the seat of government? Uh, it's the administrative center of the government. If you look this word up in the, in the Hebrew dictionary, it's going to say this, the foundations of society. Whoever is providing the advice of fear into David's life says, look around you, David. The foundation of society has crumbled. There's a documented time in David's life when the very foundation of society, over which he was the king, crumbled underneath him. 2 Samuel 15, 
2 Samuel 15. If you want to flip there, you can. Hold your finger in Psalm 11. David had a son named Absalom. And it says in 2 Samuel 15 too that Absalom would rise early and he'd stand by the gate. And when people would come to see the king, Absalom would stop them. And in verse 4, he would say, Oh, that I were judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me. And I would give him justice. In other words, so sad that the king doesn't have time for you. So sad that the king can't give you justice. If I was the king, I could take care of you. Verse 5, whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, Absalom would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. And verse 6 says, Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. David's own son has turned the hearts of Israel against their king and the very foundation of society has crumbled underneath David. It says in verse 12, while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counselor, David's trusted friend, from his city Gilo, and the conspiracy grew strong. And the people with Absalom kept increasing. Verse 13, a messenger came to David. I have a hunch. I cannot be dogmatic about this, but I have a hunch that this very well could have been the advice of fear that David wrote about in Psalm 11. A messenger came to David and said, The hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. And then David said to all of his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us quickly, and bring down ruin on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. In this moment, for David, everything about his circumstances, everything about his feelings is advising and asking, Hey David, what can the righteous do now? The foundations are destroyed. Can I read a few headlines from last Thursday? More than 150 countries and territories have confirmed Coronavirus cases. Americans stranded abroad struggle to get home as border closures intensify. Washington's trillion dollar coronavirus fix may be too little, too late. Coronavirus shatters New Jersey family. The coronavirus's effect will carry into 2021. And the headlines go on and on and on. The question this morning is this. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Go back to Psalm 11. And I want to show you how the whole psalm begins. David says in verse number 1, In the Lord I take refuge. In the Lord I take refuge. You know, I am terribly nearsighted. If I take my glasses off, I, 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 can't, I can see okay about four inches in front of my face. But I am, I am terribly nearsighted. I cannot see. Everything is a blur out there without my glasses. And I can remember me and my brother Clint, we was teenagers, and our parents would take us down to Daytona Beach. And every summer we'd lay out by the pool. And, I'd, of course, I didn't want to lay out with my glasses. That ain't cool. And so I told Clint, I said, now look, if a pretty girl is coming... Just, just say, here she comes, and then I'll, you know, I'll flex my pecs, or, you know, I'll swell up my chest, or I'll kind of tighten up my muscles, and, you know, I'll show off my six-pack, or whatever, you know. And so, <clears throat> he, my brother, he'd say, here she comes. So I'd start, you know, my routine, and then some 50-something-year-old dude with a beer belly would walk by, and I'm like, I'm going to kill you. So here's my problem. 
I, without the right lens, I can't, I can't see, right? We, we said this. We said that for you and I to take in the larger distance, right? Because fear can only see things up close. But for faith to take in the larger distance, we got to have the right lens. When David says, I take refuge this is in the perfect tense. Now, I don't want to get all bogged down in that, but you know perfect tense is completed action. It's completed action with ongoing results. What is the point? The point is David is making a statement about a decision he has made. David is talking about completed action that has ongoing results in his life. The word refuge, to take refuge, it, 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 it's the idea of a bird Flying to take refuge, to take, to take shelter. We had a tragedy happen at our house a few months ago. Uh, one of our friends from church had given us a kitten. Now, that, even that sentence doesn't really make sense. I mean, it's an oxymoron that a friend would give you a kitten, right? But anyway, that, that, that happened. And, uh, and um, so Sarah Beth loves her kitties. And uh, I, I can tolerate kitties only because I dislike mice more than I dislike cats. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, I came home from work and uh, we had named this kitty Nugget. And uh, the, the dogs were playing with Nugget. And I saw them. They were playing. I mean, there was nothing vicious about what was going on. And uh, so I just came on in the house. I feel terrible about it because when it became time to do the chores, Sarah Beth went out to feed Nugget. And I heard a, a terrible scream, uh, and uh, of course I knew what had happened. I ran outside, and uh, Nugget was gone. Um, the dogs, I mean, the, the nugget, no bite marks, no blood. The dogs hadn't eaten Nugget. I, I honestly think they accidentally killed Nugget, just playing. But I don't know for sure, but, but she was gone, and she had not been gone long. She was still warm, and... and um, so it was a it was a bad it was a tough night for us and and so our friends did what friends do right our friends brought us another kitty right and uh, and and we named this kitty in honor of Nugget we named this kitty Nugget and so now we've got a new Nugget I got another Nugget and uh, so now we have a routine before we let the dogs out of the pen to run in the evening. We put Nugget in the kennel. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I thought, let me run. I'll, I'll open the kennel. I'll let the dogs out. Then I'll run in the house, tell Sarah to get the kitty. Because kitty usually sitting on the porch. Well, I got sidetracked between the dog kennel and the house. And I forgot. And about an hour later, I heard Sarah Beth screaming. And I thought, oh, no, Lord, please, no, not again. Go out in the backyard. Nugget. The dogs had chased Nugget up in the black walnut tree behind our house. And uh, Nugget's just sitting up there. He's not the least bit worried about those dogs because th those dogs in a million tries cannot climb that black walnut tree. Guys, that's the image here. That's the image. The image is seeking refuge from a storm or a threat and finding a firm position. And Nugget had found a firm position up that walnut tree. Can you write this down? When David said, I have taken refuge in the Lord, he's saying this, the people of God have a firm foundation. The people of God have a firm position. We have a firm position. Now, the word Lord <clears throat> is in all caps in your Bible. That's because this is the word Yahweh. This is the covenant name of God. This is the name when Moses was meeting with God in Exodus 3 at the burning bush. And he said, all right, when I go to the people and they ask me what your name is, what will I tell them? And, and God said, I am who I am. And that's this word Yahweh. And it comes from the verb to be. And it literally means I cause to be what is. The Holman Dictionary says God's response to Moses is not a name that makes God an object of definition or limitation. Rather, it is an affirmation that God is always subject, always free to be and act as God 
wills. Folks, Yahweh is the self-existent one who brings into existence everything that exists. And when David says, in Yahweh, in other words, the one who is never the object but always the subject, the one who is the victor and never the victim, uh, the one who surprises and is never surprised, the, the one who thwarts, the one who thwarted Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar and Haman, but is never thwarted. The one who manipulates, but is never manipulated. David says, in this Yahweh, I have taken refuge. Hey, I need to ask you a question this morning. Have you taken refuge in Yahweh? You know, the New Testament way to ask that question is this. Are you born again? Jesus said in John 3, 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, in the ministry, I've sat at the bedside of men and women as they were dying. Scores and scores of them. Some as their brains were filling with blood. Some as their lungs were filling with fluid. Some as their bodies were filling with ammonia. Some as their minds were filling with confusion. And in those moments, there was one thing that mattered. 401Ks didn't matter. Health insurance didn't matter. The square footage of, of their house didn't matter. The size of their farm or their four-wheeler didn't matter. What mattered? What mattered this past weekend, a day or two ago, when Kenny Rogers took his last breath, was not how many Grammys he had won. One thing matters. Are you born again? One thing matters. Have you taken refuge in the Lord? David says, my hope is the self-existent covenant God of Israel. If you study David's route when he left Jerusalem, when Absalom and his coup began to emerge, David left Jerusalem, he went across what's known as the Kidron Valley. He went over the Mount of Olives, he crossed the Jordan, and he went to a place called Mahanaim. Mahanaim was actually named by Jacob, the patriarch, in Genesis 32. Jacob had left Laban and was headed to confront his brother Esau. And in that moment, Jacob feared that Esau would try to kill him. Genesis 32, 1, Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he named the place Mahanaim. And that literally means two camps. Jacob realized he was not camping alone, that God was with him. Mahanaim, God's camp, became, listen very carefully, the base of David's operation in his struggle with his own son, Absalom. Wherever you are in the crises of life, wherever you are camping, remember, if you belong to God, you do not camp alone. God camps with you. And we're, we don't have a lot of time to study this, but if you know the history between David and Absalom, it's not a surprise really that Absalom rose up and tried to steal the kingdom. But I tell you what did surprise David. Ahithophel, his trusted friend, turned on him. Most scholars agree David wrote Psalm 55 in that time. Verse 12 he said, it's not an enemy who taunts me. I could bear that. It's not an adversary who deals insolently with me. I, then I could hide from him, but it is you. A man, my equal, my companion, and my friend. You ever had a friend turn his or her back on you? You know, it's one thing to have an enemy attack you. Or a stranger be unkind. But to have a friend, a sister... To have a parent abuse you. To have the one who stood in the altar before God and man. 
And say for richer or poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part, to have that person turn and walk out on you. It's to have the foundations crumble. It's to have your world turned upside down. I had a lady in this building about five years ago look me in the face and say, How could a loving God allow somebody to do what they did to me? Some of you today could say, How could a loving God allow a virus to sweep across the world killing thousands of people? Well, I told that lady five years ago, I said, you know, I don't think I could think of a worse event. I said, I know what happened to you was horrible. But I don't think I could dream up a worse event than the murder of the Son of God. Can you? And she said, no, I can't. And I said, well, you know that happened, right? And she said, yes. And then I called her attention to Romans 3.25 where Paul said, God displayed Jesus publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. Pastor Paul, are you telling me the murder of Jesus was all God's doing? It was all a part of God's plan? No, I'm not saying that. The Bible says that. Listen to the first sermon in the New Testament. Peter said in Acts 2.22, Men of Israel... Listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. And so I'd say this to you. If God can take the sin of murdering His own Son and in His sovereign providential will can use that to buy our freedom from eternal damnation, then I would say He can also govern sin and sickness and disaster and pandemics for His good purposes. Look at Psalm 11.4. The Lord, this is Yahweh, the Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Write this down. Not only do we have a firm position, but God's people have a firm position rooted in His fundamental providence. His fundamental providence. You know, the word fundamental just means this. A central providence. Or primary rule. A principle on which something is based. You know, I don't know what the days ahead hold for America. But I can assure you of this. Even if and when the foundations of America have been destroyed, God has not lost control. God is still on His holy throne. You know, in this time of testing, David... David's faith began to grow in the providence of God. They tried to get David to take the ark with him when he fled Jerusalem. And he said this. This is 2 Samuel 15, 25. Carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, He will bring me back and let me see both it and His dwelling place. But if He says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, I here I am, let Him do to me what seems good to Him. Look at verse 4 in our text. His eyes see, His eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous. This word eyelids in the Hebrew, it's referring to squinting your eyes. You know, when you're really trying to see something closely, what do you do? You squint your eyes, don't you? Or I I have to lift up my glasses now because I'm not old enough for bifocals. But I need them. But we squint our eyes. What is this? This is what's called anthropomorphism. It's basically giving God human-like characteristics to understand His nature. We talk about the arm of the Lord, the hand of God, God's eyelids squinting. In other words... 
this is God looking closely, examining the, the men and women. And I want to say, God knows where you are this morning. And God uses hard times like we're in to examine His people. To distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. In 1 Peter 1, Peter said, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I talked to you about walking into that impound lot in Porterdale, Georgia. You know, my dad's death was a testing of my faith. I actually tried to walk away from God. God was calling me into the ministry when my dad died. And I tried to walk away from God. I decided I wasn't going to be a Christian anymore. But you see, in that very difficult time, God tested my faith. And it was proven genuine in the fire. Look at verse 5 and 6. But his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. You know, can I be very honest with you this morning? This firm position that the people of God have is not universal. Those who reject the free gift of God's righteousness that is available to anyone that will turn to to Jesus in repentance and faith, those who reject that, they will drink forever the cup of God's wrath. But look at verse 7. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. You say, Pastor Paul, how could I ever be righteous? I'm a sinner. Well, that, my friends, is the gospel. The Bible says, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He made Him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. You know, when that first little kitten died, Nugget, Brandy had Sarah Beth in the house and she was consoling her and I had that little kitten in my hands. And what I'm about to tell you, you're not going to believe But I sat out on the back patio with that little kitten in my arms pushing on her little chest asking God for a miracle to bring that little cat back to life. And I massaged her little heart pushing, doing CPR on a kitten asking God to bring that cat back to life. You know why I did that? Because I love my kids. I love my kids. If a fallen sinful man who doesn't even like cats would love his child enough to sit for 30 minutes in the cold massaging the carcass of a kitten, praying for its supernatural resurrection, think about how much more God loves us. So much that He gave His only begotten Son that everyone who believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Look at the end of verse 7. The upright will behold His face. Write this down. We as God's people have a firm position rooted by God's fundamental providence. Write this down. Securing from which we hope in our future as promised. We have a firm position rooted by God's fundamental providence. From which we hope in our future as promised. Let me me close out with this. David was not the only rejected king to walk through the Kidron Valley. Through the Garden of the Olive Press in a state of anguish. A thousand years later another king... Walked through that same valley betrayed by a friend. His name is Jesus. He was not just a man. He was the God-man. Driven out of town as a suffering servant. Led as a lamb to the slaughter. And He laid down His life for me and you. 
And if you know the story of David, a few days later, David came back to the city. He reassumed his throne victorious over those who sought his death. And if you know the story, a few days later, Jesus came back into the city, appeared to his followers, and reassumed his place at the right hand of God the Father. And he was not just a king, he is the king of kings. And there is coming a day, according to the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 1, John saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Verse 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain. I'm tempted to insert the word virus right there. Anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold... I am making all things new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. You know, I think about this psalm of David, Psalm 11, that he wrote in a time of, well, a time when the foundations were destroyed. Did you notice who he addressed it to? The choir master. David said, you know, Uh, look at all the junk around me. I serve a God who turns junk into jazz music. Look at all the mess. I serve a God who takes the mess and makes music. Here's the big idea. Our faithful God, the answer of faith in God turns stress about my situation into a song about His sovereignty. The answer of faith in God turns stress about my situation into a song about His sovereignty. We don't know for sure who wrote Psalm uh, Psalm 121. I have a hunch it was David. You remember that psalm? I will lift up my eyes to the mountains and ask this question. From where shall my help come? Here's the answer of faith. My help comes from the Lord, Yahweh, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. G. Campbell Morgan said this, It is the man who measures things by the circumstances of the hour who is filled with fear and counsels and practices flight. The man who sees Jehovah enthroned and governing has no panic. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today. That we have the answer of faith for the advice of fear. Lord, I am 100% sure there are men and women who are going to watch this message. Maybe they've just seen this message. And had there not been a coronavirus sweep our country, they would not have heard this sermon. God, I pray... That your Holy Spirit would open that man's eyes right now, that woman's eyes right now, to the fact that you love him. You love her. And we live in these frail, fragile bodies. Kenny Rogers got 81 years, but that's more than most people get. And there's going to come a day It is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And God, for believers, for those who are born again and have taken refuge in the Lord, we have nothing to fear. But for the unrepentant 
And for the lost and the unregenerate, those not born again, there is something to fear and it's not the coronavirus. It is the wrath of God. And Father, I I pray that right now, sitting on the couch or or in a recliner or or driving down the road, that that a man or a woman, a teenager, a, a boy or a girl would turn to you, would take refuge in you and say, I surrender all to you, Jesus. You're my Lord. I believe that you died for me and you rose again. Take my life. I'm yours. Christians, would you hear me today? This is a great time of testing. This is a great time for us to put our faith more than ever in our lives in Jesus, in a sovereign God who cannot be thwarted, who accomplishes all His good pleasure. Thank you, God, for this promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great weekend, great day. Love you guys.